Hi everyone, this is Dr. Saida Fallofini from Cal Poly Pomona. In this module, we are going to talk about patient flow. Um, so this module covers understanding uh, about the hospital setting and healthcare setting, especially in the US, and uh, the whole concept of patient flow. What do we mean by the patient flow? And what are some of the issues and difficulties that different sections of the hospitals are facing that, uh, that we uh, better know or have some information about if we are going to work uh, in, a, in a healthcare setup as a systems engineer. So the first thing I want to talk about is different types of healthcare settings. The first type is primary care doctors. Uh, primary care doctors are usually the first point, point of our contact with the healthcare setups. They are the doctors that we will see for any type of preventive or uh, restorative treatments that we need. And uh, they are the ones that provide referrals to more specialized doctors if we need additional or further treatments. They are the ones who have the information of the health of the patient. They are the ones who know the history of the patient. And they are the ones who uh, that, that the patient should contact first for most of the difficulties that the patient have. And they are the ones that then they provide the referral so the patient can go to, to the next step. If the patient needs to see uh, more specialized doctors, they, the, the primary care doctors are the ones that provide the referral so the patient can go to the next stage and see the doctors that are specialized in a specific domain. domain. So um, the next um, type of healthcare setting are uh, ambulatory care. And these are the type of, um, basically we call outpatient basis. So these are the type of care that we need um, uh, we, we need to spend some time in the healthcare settings, healthcare settings, maybe for some procedures, maybe for some diagnostics, maybe we need to perform some um, different type of MRIs, x-rays, and so forth, or perform some procedures that are not very um, extensive, but we consider these type of treatments or these type of patients as outpatient basis or ambulatory care. So they still use the healthcare setup more than what we spend, uh, more than the time that we spend with the primary care, but still they are outpatient. At the end of the day, they are released and they go back home. So they don't stay in the hospital. And so that's what we call it with the outpatient care or ambulatory care. Um, emergency care, um, obviously uh, you, you probably have heard about it or maybe you have used this type of settings. Um, so they are the type of settings that uh, are used for urgent scenarios. Um, so if we have um, heart attacks, if we have um, car, car accidents, for example, any urgent scenarios, if our hands or foot are broken, um, any type of stroke that can happen, all these emergency situations are the visits that needs to be made to the emergency care. And um, also uh, another type of uh, other type of patients that usually use emergency care are the patients that are not insured or underinsured because a lot of the times in the emergency cares emergency care they don't uh, uh, check for the insurance first to check the patient. So those that do not have insurance or are underinsured also are important uh, or a major part of them, not a major part, but they are also uh, users of the emergency care. So, uh, and also one other important data point that I think is good for you guys to know is that um, about 90% of the, of the patients that end up go to the hospital and stay in the hospital, they are the ones that, are go, that, that go from emergency care. So for patients, as I said, since these are emergency situations like accidents, strokes, heart attacks, and so forth, they are not usually the type of patients that just get treated and go back home most of the patients and as you can see 90 percent of these patients are the ones that end up end up they end up staying in the hospital and they are the ones that that get transferred to the hospital setting and then outpatient surgical care uh, so these are the type of patients that need surgery but they do not need to stay in the hospital a lot of uh, they do not need to stay in the hospital a lot of uh, times uh, patients that need surgery need to spend some time in the hospital, but for outpatient um, surgery, uh, these are some uh, facilities that can provide operations, 
but the, the patients usually um, uh, are good to go in, in a matter of a day. So they don't end up staying in the hospital overnight. And then uh, obviously operating rooms are another important part of the healthcare settings. And um, so these are the, the settings in which the operations are done. Usually the patients that uh, use operating rooms are the patients that end up staying in the hospital. They are what we call inpatient as opposed to outpatient. Outpatients are the ones that get treated and leave the hospitals, but inpatients are the ones that come to the hospitals, but they end up staying in the hospital. Um, the type of um, operations that mm, usually are performed in the operating rooms are uh, um, categorized as either elective or emergent. Uh, emergent operations obviously are the ones that are, need to be done under emergency. As I said, a lot of suddenly maybe cardiac arrest or um, emergency visits because of the accident. So a lot of maybe some of those visits that go from the um, emergency room to the hospitals are the ones that need to um, uh, perform emergent operations. And then elective operations are the ones that um, needs to be performed, but they are not urgent. Like for example, I'm, I'm just giving an example. If, if there is a nose operation, for example, or some uh, plastic surgery and things like that, they are they 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 may they are not in the uh, uh, emergent category, but they are electives. And, uh, and they are the ones and actually later in the rest of the presentation, we talk about the fact that sometimes when emergent operations come and uh, we don't have uh, time or we don't have enough staff, we may push elective operations uh, to other days so that we can perform emergent operations. But, uh, but these are also two terms that I want you guys to be familiar with, uh, emergent operations and elective operations. Because uh, as we talked about in previous session, uh, one of the main issues that operating rooms are facing is related to the scheduling of the operations. And, uh, and as you work on developing these schedules, you have to know which operations are elective, which operations are emergent, and among elective operations, which one of them have higher priority and which one of them do not. And in the operating rooms, um, a lot of the hospitals use the, the, the block time for the uh, for their scheduling. And the whole block time idea is that they block the time of an operating uh, operation room for a doctor and uh, based on the historical data on how many operations that doctor has perform in the past in that operating room and what is the utilization of that operating room. Uh, so, so this method is what they call as block time, as, which, as I said, they, they block a, 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 a chunk of time of a block uh, of an operating room and they assign that to a doctor. And later in the presentation, we will talk about the fact that this is such an inefficient method for using the uh, operating room and for utilizing the operating room. But, but that's a method that actually is used currently with, uh, by a lot of the hospitals. And then um, the whole inpatient care is about, as I said, about the whole concept that, that the patients stay in the hospital for a, uh, for a period of treatment. Uh, then we say outpatient, as I said, is when the patients come to the hospital, get the treatment and they leave. Inpatient is the scenario when the patients need to stay in the hospital. And, uh, and in terms of the, 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 the space or the rooms, um, that are assigned to their patients, we have three categories, the floor, step-down units, and ICU. Uh, the floor uh, for, uh, is uh, composed of all those units or rooms um, that are assigned to the patients, but the patients have a basic level of urgency or as the intensity of the, uh, of the care that is required for the patient goes uh, higher, then the patients go from the floor to the step down unit. So in the step down in the step down unit, the the rooms are a little more uh, equipped and they can provide a higher intensity care. And as the situation of the patient is getting worse and the patient needs even more equipment to to uh, be treated, then the patient is transformed to the uh, intensity uh, intensive care unit or ICU. Um, so based on the uh, intensity of the care that the patient needs, if, if, it's, if it's regular, normal, the patient goes to the floor, as the level of uh, intensity of the care uh, gets higher and higher, we go to the step-down unit and to the uh, ICU. 
And uh, usually in inpatient care or in hospitals, then the care is provided by the by nurses, by doctors, by the therapists, and, and also the rest of the support staff. Uh, usually each nurse is in, in responsible for providing care for four patients, but some hospitals, depending on the intensity of the uh, care that the patients need, sometimes also uh, uh, it has happened that they assign two patients to a nurse. So depending on, on the intensity of the patients that are assigned to a nurse, we may see four patients per nurse all the way to two patients per nurse. And um, and as, a, as, as we said, um, most of the admissions to the inpatient care or to the hospitals are coming from the emergency department. Or, and, uh, and, and that's actually as, as we, is forming 90% of those admissions. But then if the patient needs to stay in the medical facility for a long period of time because of the chronic situations that they have, then those patients are referred to the long-term care. Uh, nursing home or assisted living facilities are some examples of the, of the long-term care. Um, so in, in, in uh, a lot of these healthcare setups, um, some of the main issues are uh, operational inefficiencies. So the operations that are performed, the actions or activities that are performed are inefficient and they use a lot of resources. They have limited capacity to provide response to the demand that exists. And also they have an uh, issue with the flow of the patients. So when the, the, from the point that the patient enters, they, it would take a long time till the point that the ex, that patient leaves the facility. And there are a lot of complications in this process. Patient flow talks about the movement of the patients from the point of the admission to the point of the of discharge and everything that happens in between. And, and our goal is to be able to provide a smooth patient flow so that um, the patient can be um, treated and leave the facility as soon as possible. Um, so what happens if we have poor patient, uh, patient flow? That um, can affect the patient health. If the patient doesn't care, uh, doesn't get the required uh, care at the right amount of time, that can worsen the conditions of the patient. It can also put a lot of burden, uh, financial burden on the healthcare facility and also on the patient. If, for example, the hospital is going to charge the patient based on the number of nights that patient is going to end up being in the hospital, but the patient ended up being longer in the hospital just because the flow was not as smooth or just because there were some problems in the hospital, then that's a financial burden not only on the patient, but also on the hospital side. Then the need for improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the patient flow and clinical flow is definitely something that we need from a healthcare setting. And it's definitely the type of problems that healthcare systems need uh, help with. And, uh, and a lot of those type of work are the ones that healthcare systems engineers uh, can do. So um, variability is definitely variability concept or presence of variability in the healthcare setting is definitely one of the factors that contributes significantly to uh, an, a, a patient flow that is not smooth. Um, I want you guys to give me some example uh, as what do you think are some sources of variability um, in, in a healthcare setting, for example, in a hospital. What are some sources of variability? Uh, like flu season or like the COVID right now or previously when it was kind of more of an outbreak. Okay, so how that, okay, so that, that that's def definitely correct, but in what form? So you might have a normal flow of, let's say, whatever amount of people, then all of a sudden there's a flow of like 10x what you'd normally see. Yeah, that's definitely uh, that correct. So that is one source of variability. The rate of the patients that come, the frequency of the patients that come to the healthcare setting is one. At some periods, we get a lot of patients. At some periods, we may not get that much patient. The, the number of patients that we get goes up and down. That makes the planning a lot harder. That's one. What else? So, so let's assume the patients come to the facility. And let's assume even I know I'm going to get 100 patients today. 
what can make planning a little hard for me? You don't know the reason why they're coming in. Exactly. I, I don't know that. And um, I, I, and I don't know the severity of the issues that they are facing. And, and these are all different type sources of variability uh, in the healthcare setting that makes planning uh, a lot harder. Or part of the effort that we need to spend in a healthcare setup is to deal with the variability, find the sources of variability, and be able to somehow manage the presence of variability. If we can do a better job in prediction and in managing the variability, then we can do a better job in uh, uh, providing the uh, treatment and um, uh, making sure that the patient flow is smooth. Um, the due to presence of variability and a poor planning, then we may see um, staffing levels. Um, I think that that's the issue that Diana mentioned. We may not have enough staff or enough equipment at some point to be able to provide the care just because uh, of the because of the presence of variability. At some point, we have received a lot of patients. Um, the workloads of our physicians and patients and, and nurses and technicians can go up and down. Um, at some point, we didn't expect to receive that much patients, so our uh, physicians and our, our nurses are going to uh, to be overloaded with the uh, with a lot of the work that they receive, and also uh, bad. Um, and also the, the occupancy of the beds that we have. So also uh, that is going to be uh, go through a lot of fluctuations. And that uh, the bed occupancy is also one of the factors that can have, uh, has a lot of other effects. So for example, the patients that come from the emergency room to the hospitals may not be able to do this transition just because there's no available bed. However, we do not have available bed because some of the patients could potentially be out of the hospitals, but they are not because the planning and the patient flow was not smooth. And that did not, and the, the patient flow was not smooth because the variability was not uh, uh, predicted and was not treated properly. So, um, as I mentioned, if we um, can predict and we can manage variability, then we can allocate resources properly, we can improve the patient outcomes. Our staffs can have a better load and better morals, and uh, we can reduce the cost overall in the healthcare setups and the quality of the care that is provided to the patient obviously is going to be improved as well. So we need to be able to work on the patient flow and try to improve patient flow. We need to have a systematic approach. Uh, we need to see the whole system and all the elements that exist, the relation with each other, and uh, and then see what are the issues that exist, and then they provide a solution and improve the patient flow. This should be done usually from the point that the patient is uh, admitted to the hospital to the point that the patient is discharged. We talk about the admission and discharge. As I said, the patient flow should be considered from the point of admission to the point, the point of discharge. Admission is the when the patient is coming to the hospital and is going to the units that need, uh, that provide more intense care. And then discharge is the, the, the point that the patient leaves the hospital and provides, uh, and then does not need the intense care. When the patient is going from, uh, is getting to the admission point, usually that's the scenario when the patient is going from emergency room, most of the time. Sometimes the patient may come from the primary care, but most of the time patient is going from emergency room to the hospitals, for example. And to get this uh, to, to the admission point. And uh, in that uh, point, one of the things that is going to help with the smooth transition for going from the uh, emergency room to the uh, hospital is the transfer of the data. And usually if we have electronic medical records or electronic health records, that is going to go a long way in helping to uh, transfer uh, information of the patient to the uh, next unit, which is usually uh, the hospital. And uh, one um, other thing that is going to help a lot is that if the patient is going to uh, go with a specified care plan, so uh, the patient is going to be admitted to the hospital with a specified care plan in terms of what are the things that needs to be done for the patient. And again, those are the ones that we can find in uh, electronic uh, health records of the patients. 
And usually it is going also to help uh, a lot if there is a checklist at the admission point to see, uh, to check a couple of things that needs to be done or to, or to make sure that they know uh, once the patient is getting admitted to the, um, to the hospital. Um, one of the main bottlenecks for this transition or, or one of the main reasons for these transitions not to be smooth is uh, the lack of bed in the hospitals. Um, so the patient uh, is, has been diagnosed in the uh, emergency care. Maybe the patient has received the initial uh, treatment in the ER. Uh, and now the patient needs to be transformed to the hospital. However, the lack of capacity and the lack of beds in the hospital is the one that can prevent transition of a patient. And that's exactly one of the points in the uh, as we try to understand the patient flow, that's the transition point. And one of the things that we need to do as a, a systems engineer too is to find out how we can remove that bottleneck, like how we can make sure there is capacity or enough capacity in the hospital setting, so the transition of patients from emergency room to the hospitals is going to happen uh, a lot smoother. So these are some statistics that most of them are coming from the U.S. Um, so half of the hospitals in the U.S. have specified their emergency department at, um, at capacity or over capacity. Um, the, in in uh, 1998, the um, Waiting time in the emergency room or emergency department was about 45 minutes, but it came to about 55 minutes in 2010. And there is uh, there there is some data that in uh, at currently it's a, a lot more about um, 200 minutes or so. Then the, a lot of efforts then that are spent in smooth in in improving the patient flow is on trying to find out how patients. Uh, can have a smooth flow in emergency departments and how they can potentially leave emergency departments a lot faster. And um, these decisions um, uh, or policies that can be put in place so the patients have a smoother flow in the emergency department. Some of them uh, are related to the inputs to the emergency department. Some of them related are related to what is happening in the emergency department. And some of them are related to the output situations in the emergency departments. Um, the, the, the issues related to the input is that, as, as some of you mentioned, we get a lot of patients and we don't know much about the rate of the patients that we are going to receive. Um, sometimes we may receive a lot of patients, sometimes we may receive less patients. One of the issues that have been observed, especially recently, is that a lot of patients go to the emergency rooms, not because they have emergent situation, but because they, do, they won't be able to get a hold of their primary care doctor in a reasonable time. So that's one of one reasons uh, they may end up going to um, emergency room. Uh, for example, um, some people may have some uh, fractures or some uh, broken hands or legs, and they may they may get the initial treatment, but then later in the first couple of days they may see some worsening in their situations. For example, with a lot of uh, a broken hand or foot or fractures, that the bruise is going to spread, and the situations in, may get a little worse in the uh, first day or two. And those type of patients may need to see a, a, a doctor again. Um, however, they may not be able to get a hold of their primary doctor immediately. So those are the type of patients that end up going to the emergency rooms. Um, however, those type of situations are not urgent and they don't need the emergency treatment. But since those patients do not want to wait for a couple of days till they can see their primary care, they may end up going to uh, emergency departments. Um, so the, again, the, the rate of the patients or the frequency of the patients that come to the emergency departments is going up and down. And that's one of the factors that affects definitely the patient flow in the emergency department because we won't be able to plan properly. And then um, the inadequate staff in the emergency department is definitely another factor that affects the patient flow. Patients get in, but they may not be able to leave um, uh, at the right time. Also, um, another uh, factor related to the operation or the, to, to the throughput at the hospitals is how they are going to prioritize uh, the patients. Um, 
uh, they have some checklists that based on the symptoms that they see, they're going to prioritize the patients, but there are also some uh, issues related, for, for example, to some patients with mental health. Those are the ones, the patients with mental health are the ones that may not have any signs, physical signs to see, okay, there's a cut, there's a bruise, or there's a broken bone. They may not have anything like that, but they're actually, their intensity, intensity of their situation is high. But since they may not show it physically, they are the ones who will not receive high priority to be seen. And since there may be a, a long delay in their treatment, that would lead to the worsening of their condition. And, uh, and then the issues related to the output uh, from the emergency department. As we said, a lot of the patients from the emergency departments are the ones that end up uh, going to the hospital to stay in the hospital for a period of treatment. But if there is not enough bed, if there is no available bed in the hospital, they won't be able to do the transition. So they end up staying at the uh, at um, emergency department. Uh, so these are the patients that already have been processed in the emergency department, but they cannot leave because there's no available bed in the hospital. They, they, they end up staying in the, uh, in the beds that are available in the emergency department that would occupy a room or a bed that would definitely put further delay in the time that, uh, or a, a, a further, further delay in treatment of other patients. So these are all the type of um, issues that make planning for the emergency rooms a lot harder. Issues related to the arrival rate of the patients, um, issues related to the availability of the staff and, try and, and prioritizing the patients and the treatments that they need, and then issues related to um, sending the patients out of the emergency department to the hospitals or to other care units if that's what needs to be done mainly because those other units are full, so these transitions cannot be done. If we want to improve the patient flow in emergency department, there are a couple of solutions. Um, so one of them is to improve access to the primary care doctors. As I said, there it happens a lot of times that the patients can be treated by their primary care doctors, but since it takes time to find appointment with the primary care doctor, they just give up on setting an appointment with their primary care doctor and they go to an emergency department. And then um, also it has happened that um, um, in, some, uh, uh, in some medical facilities, they have pr uh, uh, provided a separate care unit um, for minor injuries that come to the emergency department. Uh, so they are not as emergent as others, but they still need to some treatment. So they have provided a separate unit. So once the patient comes, they look at the patients. If, the, if it's emergent and it needs intense care, maybe it's treated in a different parts. But if it's not, if it's minor injuries and they can be treated a lot faster, they are treated at a different part. So that way they can definitely uh, provide maybe service to some of the customers faster. They, and they can also provide service to some patients that need urgent care a lot faster. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, um, what happens is that the initial triage in the hospitals happens by nurses. So, um, but some uh, there's, there are some studies that may mention that if the initial triage is performed by the physicians, they may be able to do a better job in terms of uh, what patient needs to get what type of priority, and then that affects the rest, the rest of the patient flow in the in the healthcare setting. The other um, type of solutions that have been tried in some hospitals is there's the team-based care, that when the patient comes, if they, if they need a team to provide the care to the patient, usually that's the case for the patients that are coming from accidents that have, have happened, they may need a team of uh, physicians to provide care to the patient. They also have seen those who provide faster service and more effective service as well. And also presence of technological improvement or uh, technological uh, advancement in the uh, in emergency room is going to help as well. Obviously, presence of um, 
um, electronic medical records. There are also some um, technologies related to re real-time locating systems in terms of knowing um, at which part of the healthcare setting the patient needs and in what type of treatments they are using and so forth. And if these type of features are able to connect it with each other, uh, are, are able to get connected and work in an integrated way, that would also facilitate the uh, flow of the patient. Um, one other term that you may see if, uh, if you end up working um, for a healthcare facility is the term of boarding, and that's related to emergency departments as well, because uh, as I said, emergency departments are uh, definitely one of the healthcare units or healthcare facilities in which patient flow for a long, long, long time has had a lot of problems. Uh, patients end up uh, uh, waiting or uh, in the health, in the emergency department for a long time, and uh, a lot of the times those have led to the worsening of the health condition of the patients. That at the end has provided life-threatening situations. Um, so, what is boarding and how it's helping? So, uh, when um, a patient is getting the initial treatment in the emergency department and they need to go to the hospital. However, there is no bed available in the hospitals. They uh, spend some time at a different unit in the emergency department till they finally can be uh, transferred to the hospital. Out of that 90%, as we said, 90% of the patients that go to the hospital are coming from uh, uh, emergency department. Out of those pa pa patients, about 80% of them are the ones that end up experiencing the boarding before they finally can be transferred to a hospital. That shows just how poor the planning is in the healthcare setting. Uh, that just shows how occupied all the beds are in the hospital setting. And that's why the patients who finish the work at the emergency department cannot immediately be transferred to the hospital. Based on the, some studies and some data that they have collected, um, so the, the median um, time that the patients end up spending um, at the boarding unit before they can be transferred to the hospital is 79, min 79 minutes, more than an hour. Uh, and uh, however, the average is about uh, 253 minutes. Um, so that's about like four hours or so. Um, so that obviously shows when the average is a lot higher. So that obviously shows that uh, there has been some really extreme situations when the patients needed to stay in the emergency room for many, many hours. And that's why they have shifted the average, average to be high. But uh, uh, we can say about 50% of the patients end up leaving the uh, emergency room, going to the uh, hospital in less than 79 minutes and about 50% of them end up spending more than 79 minutes in the, uh, in the boarding. Um, and these are all the type of, uh, uh, some of the main problems that we face with in the emergency room and in the hospitals. And so if we can do a better job in planning in, in, uh, in emergency room and in the hospitals on the number of beds that are needed and how we can make the flow of the patients better so that they can leave the hospital faster, then we can make sure we have uh, available beds so we can admit the patients from the emergency room a lot faster. Long uh, boarding times uh, have increased the mortality rate because they have not received the required care at the right time. And, um, and the primary cause for boarding for not being able to be transferred to the hospital when you when the patients need it is the lack of beds. Um, what are some of the potential solutions that can be done? The, the hospitals can try to increase their capacity. Um, there's one institution that increased their capacity of their ICUs from 47 to 67 that um, decreased the length of the uh, stay of the patients, um, and um, also um, th that also decreased the, um, the the number of hours that has been spent on uh, ambulance diversion. And the concept of ambulance diversion means the scenario when uh, there are some emergency situations and ambulances bring the patients to the hospitals or emergency rooms. However, since the 
emergency rooms or emergency departments or the hospitals are full, they are uh, the ambulances are directed to other uh, hospitals. And again, those are situations that can uh, endanger the life of the patients that are being transferred to the emergency room or to the hospitals. However, because of the lack of the capacity, the, the, the ambulance has been diverted to other healthcare facilities so, so they can receive the care that they need. Uh, but that delays the, the, uh, the process or that delays the time till the patient finally receives the care. And um, the other solution that some healthcare settings have implemented is to open um, an area where the patients who have been visited in an emergency department can stay in, they can receive some intermediate treatments till they finally are transferred to the hospital floor. But all of those obviously require um, resources and require costs, and they are not solutions that can easily be implemented. But um, um, some some solutions that can be done um, with, with the current resources and with the current facilities is to try to improve the patient flow and to try to uh, predict and manage variability a lot better try to plan a lot better. So hopefully the patients with, with the same setup, with the same resources, we still would be able to provide care to a lot more patients um, in a reasonable time. Another um, uh, place in the healthcare setting where I have seen uh, systems engineers have been used a lot is in operating rooms. And uh, the main thing that they are going to help with in operating rooms or for operating rooms is to help with the scheduling of operating rooms. Um, the, 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 the type of scheduling that most of the healthcare settings are using currently is um, what is called as the block time. And as I said, in this method, depending on the historical data on uh, which doctor is performing uh, operations in which room and how many operations they have performed in the past, they are going to allocate a block of time to that doctor. That doctor may use all of that time or they may not, but that's how the block of time of the operating rooms are being allocated to their doctors. Um, there are also um, some, what they call a trauma room that they are going to keep for um, emergent uh, or urgent cases that they may have uh, happen. Um, so if any uh, emergency situ situations uh, happens, those um, uh, surgeries are going to be done in those trauma rooms that they're going to just keep for those type of surgeries. Um, however, surgeries, uh, surgery, surgical demand also is uh, has a really great stochastic nature. So it's not uh, deterministic, it's very random and it goes up and down over time. Um, Block scheduling obviously is not the best way to schedule the time at the operation of, of pre operating room because it does not consider variability. Yes, a patient, a, a doctor may ha in, uh, had this many uh, surgeries in previous month, but that does not mean the same situation is going to be repeated over time. Um, depending on the situations of the uh, health of the patients or the health of the population, the, the need for the surgeries or the need for different type of surgeries can go up and down. So there's a lot of variability associated with the uh, surgical needs. So that needs to be taken into account to plan for the operating room. So the block time method is definitely an inefficient method that leads to a uh, poor utilizations of the operating rooms as well, because either they end up staying unutilized for some period of time, or they are going to be overutilized for some period of time. And uh, when there is um, uh, poor planning and poor scheduling, uh, the staff, the physicians, doctors, and nurses, and, and the technicians may end up uh, being um, overloaded um, for a period of time when the, when there is a, a lot of operations or a lot of surgeries going on. And uh, so the, the scheduling of the operating room is definitely one of the areas that needs to be looked at. And we need to definitely make a shift from the block time method. We have to definitely look at historical data, consider uh, the, the need for different type of uh, operations that needs to be performed, their priorities, 
and then plan for performing the operation. So the, to, to be able to, um, when, when the effective scheduling for the operating room is done, it definitely leads to a better utilization of the OR. It helps with the turnover times. Um, so the room can be used for some operations and then can be freed and be prepared for the next operations and so forth. Uh, it also helps with the bed occupancy since the patients can be uh, operated at the right time. They can get the right treatment and they can leave the hospital at the right time. If the operations of the uh, patients for lack of a scheduling for, for, the, for the poor scheduling is going to be postponed more and more, the patient ends up being at the hospital longer and longer and they are going to occupy the bed for, the bed for a longer period of time. And um, uh, obviously the type of the surgeries that needs to be performed is going to affect the scheduling as well. And, the, the, and one of the things that also needs to be considered uh, in the scheduling is the policies for the staff. So um, some hospitals may impose the rules or policies that the, the, the staff, the nurses, physicians and so forth only work eight hours or 10 hours per day and cannot go above beyond that. So all those policies also should be considered in developing an effective schedule as well. So to be able to develop an effective schedule for the operating room, we definitely need to consider these factors. The, the, the level of utilization that we want to have for the operating room and um, the level of occupancy that we want to have for our beds, the type of surgeries we may receive, the staffing policies, and so forth. And the things that uh, make the scheduling harder and the, or the sources of variability that affects this part of the healthcare settings are one related to the variability related to emergence or emergency surgical uh, needs. Um, all those surgeries that needs to be done uh, urgently, we don't know exactly what type of surgery they are and how long they would take. And that definitely is uh, one of the main things that makes the scheduling a lot harder because as we said in previous slide, we have to keep some of the rooms, they call it trauma room, we have to keep some of the rooms for those uh, um, emergent uh, surgical demand that may arise. And, um, and even the, for the elective surgical needs, although they are the ones that doctors or people decide on they, and they can perform in a period of time, not a specific exact time, still for those, the demand uh, is variable. And obviously those also will affect uh, the, the whole, will, will make the whole scheduling a little harder for the operating rooms. But um, if you ever get assigned to help with the scheduling of the operating rooms, um, uh, make sure to know all the sources of variabilities. Make sure you can do reasonable predictions for those sources of variabilities and make sure to consider these factors, which are more like the objectives or the needs or the constraints that they have, that you have to consider in your um, um, in your um, scheduling. For example, if they tell you that each nurse can only work 10 hours, then that definitely becomes a constraint in your modeling. If they tell you that we only have 10 nurses each day, then that becomes a constraint in your scheduling. So some of the information that you get, some of them can be considered as a constraint in your modeling. Um, some of them are just some data that can be entered, like the sources of variability and so forth. And, um, and you have to consider all of those to be able to develop an effective schedule. Um, once we have those effective schedules, as opposed to those block time methods and so forth, we not only can improve utilizations of the operating rooms, Otherwise, we may have operating rooms that are overutilized some days and underutilized other days. But definitely making sure that there is reasonable load for the operating rooms across time and across days uh, is definitely one of the factors that the um, um, healthcare settings want because the operating rooms usually are equipped with a lot of expensive equipments. And just having those equipments idle definitely is not financially to the benefit of the hospitals. 
and this is and, and especially if this is an, in presence of one some of the days being overutilized and some of the days being underutilized so they want definitely the utilization to be a little even across days um they um as we develop these uh, schedulings uh, if the scheduling is uh, appropriate and is reasonable and hopefully is optimal uh, it can also minimize the boarding times. And as we said, uh, it can minimize the boarding times because if the patients receive the operations that they need, they can get the treatment that they need, they can leave the hospital at a reasonable time, the beds that are occupied can be freed, thus we can accept more patients from the emergency department. So that's how a proper schedule can minimize the boarding time because now they can come uh, faster. Either they come from the emergency department directly to the operating, uh, operating room or they come to the hospital, stay some time in the hospital and they get to then get to the operating room. And then uh, obviously uh, a right schedule, uh, uh, make, make sure that the right patient gets the right operation at the right time. And that's obviously all of that affects the quality of care and the timeliness of the care that they receive. And um, as healthcare systems engineer, as I said, this is definitely one of the areas that I have seen a lot of industrial engineers or systems engineers end up working at. Uh, they develop a set of um, scheduling um, policies. And um, then these scheduling policies that have been developed, some of them may have some differences with each other. Then they can be discussed with the board and with the team. And finally, the ones that is accepted and seems um, a more reasonable can be adopted. Um, some Obviously, the ideal scenario is that we develop an optimal scheduling where it's optimal and better than anything else. But sometimes it's not possible and we need to settle down with a little suboptimum schedule, but then we may have a couple of alternatives for the, for the suboptimum schedule. And if that happens, then that's where we need to uh, discuss the alternative with the board and then finally implement the one that is more acceptable and seems more reasonable. And obviously it would be great like any other um, system improvement, it would be great to um, monitor the performance of the healthcare setting after these new policies are implemented to monitor again um, some of the metrics, for example, for a for an operating room, uh, monitor the, the time that the patient needs to uh, get finally the surgery that they need, um, um, the, the number of times that the uh, surgery that has been scheduled for a patient has been changed, for example, um, and this happens when we have an emergent, uh, emergency situation, we need to perform an emergency surgery. However, we do not have, for example, or we have not thought about uh, trauma rooms to perform the, uh, the emergency surgeries. So in that scenario, we may push some of those elective surgeries so, so we can perform the emergency surgeries. But these elective surgeries that are going to be pushed affects the quality of the care of, of those patients, affects satisfaction of those patients. So. If we have a reasonable schedule for the operating room, we expect to have less and less elective operations that have uh, rescheduled. So these are some of the uh, performance metrics that we can consider for the emergency rooms. What, are, what, are, what is the utilization of the emergency rooms? Uh, have, been, have we been able to reduce the boarding time and by how much? How many elective uh, operations needed to be rescheduled? Um, how many um, emergency surgeries need to be performed, uh, could be performed, and they were not directed to other hospitals or other settings. So these are some of the performance met metrics that we can define for the operating rooms. And once we perform these better strategies, we can monitor these settings that and for a month or two months after implementing the new scheduling method, how these performance metrics have changed. And if they have improved, that means that the scheduling has been able to do better than the previous method. Um, another concept that um, happens in the healthcare facilities and also causes, um, can um, affect the smooth patient flow and also can affect the 
the quality of the care that the patients receive are related to the care transitions. Care transitions happens when the patient needs to go from one facility to another, go from an emergency room to a hospital, go from one hospital to another hospital that provides more specialized care. Um, in all these scenarios, uh, when, uh, when the transition of the patient happens, the information of the patients needs to be transformed. It needs to be transferred from one setting to another. However, that is not happening um, very smoothly. If, if that is not happening smoothly and properly, that, affect, that can affect quality of the care that the patient is receiving. And that also can lead to the medical error and that can affect the, li uh, the life of the patient as well. And there has ha happened uh, a lot that even in one um, facility, even in one hospital, when the patient has been transferred from ICU to the floor, the information of the patient or the type of the care that needs to be received has not been transformed properly. So the patient may have received some medications that were not correct and that has affected the, um, uh, the, 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 the patient's situation and the patient's condition. And that's actually what we call by medical errors, that once the patient has been transformed from one unit to another, either they were units that they're, they're drug, uh, in, located in different um, parts, geographically they were different, or even as I said, in one hospital, you the patient has gone from ICU to the floor or to other units. Still, if the information of the patient has not been transferred correctly, that has led to the medical errors. And actually this is one of the uh, main causes of the, one of the significant causes of the healthcare costs. This is not something that happens rarely. Me medical errors actually happen very, very frequently, uh, surprisingly. But um, um, if we have um, a high quality care transition, that would uh, lead to the um, obviously safety of the patient and to the quality of the care that the patient is going to receive. Um, yeah, so most of the things here in this slide are the ones that I already mentioned. So they're all related to the um, um, transition of the patients going from one setting to another, going from one unit to another, and the importance of the transition of the data of the patients uh, uh, to, from one setting to another. One thing that can happen is that uh, as the patients mainly um, not in one setting, not going, for example, from ICU to the uh, floor, when the patient goes from one hospital to another, it goes completely from one setting to another. Uh, usually what happens is that even if this, uh, the information and everything um, can, uh, is going to be transformed properly, uh, sometimes the doctors... In, um, in the other facility may have different interpretations of the signs and symptoms and the tests that have been performed on the patient. And that happens a lot. And they may uh, provide different type of uh, treatment plan for the patient. Um, and that also has been seen. So the patient goes from one setting to another, but different type of doctors may have different interpretation of the symptoms of the patient. And although the patient may have come to the, another, to, to the other unit with the uh, plan of care in hand, however, the different doctors in the other hospitals may change that plan uh, to some extent, just because they have different interpretations of the symptoms. So these are all the things that also can affect the quality of the patient, the quality of the care and, and that the patient can receive as well. Now, with everything that we talk about related to um, patient flow and the fact that our ultimate goal in the hospital, in the, uh, in the healthcare setting is to be able to improve patient flow and making sure that patient flow is a smooth, making sure that the patient gets to the right place at the right time and gets required service, although that's our ultimate goal, but then that's not obviously the case in a lot of healthcare facilities. That's why we 
have all these waiting times, either, either the ones that happens to get your uh, prescription from the pharmacy or, or the ones that happens in the emergency room for something on average around maybe um, two hours or so till finally the patient gets treated with the, with the long, long waiting times in the boarding. When, as we saw, sometimes patients end up waiting for four hours boarding before they finally can get a bed in a hospital. So all these waitings exist and the patient flow is not smooth and is not working properly um, because there are a lot of issues going at the hospital settings. So if we want to somehow work on the patient flow and uh, improve it, the very, very first step for us is to be able to develop a process map, develop um, graphically represent what is the patient flow, what are different steps that the patient needs to go through and what happens at each one of them. And uh, that developing that process map is going to help us to better represent what is happening at the healthcare facility. And um, process mapping is not something that is happening only for the uh, hospitals. Uh, developing a process flow uh, of the actions that happens till a product or service is uh, received by a customer is something that we actually do for any uh, either manufacturing or service facility. And that's something that we actually do as, as industrial or systems engineer, no matter what type of settings we end up working for, we may end up doing a developing process map for them. If you go to a car manufacturing, to um, a food industry, you definitely end up developing a process map. Or if they already have a process map, you end up looking at the process map, study the process map to see, okay, what are the steps that needs to be performed to get it? better sense initially of uh, the operations that need to, need to be performed, the order and so forth. And those uh, actually are going to help a lot more maybe in hospital facilities because in a manufacturing facility, uh, the operations sometimes end up to be done close to each other. So if you have a walk in a, in a manufacturing facility, you may be able to get a reasonable sense as what are the operations that needs to that are performed and what is the right order. Um, although the process map in those scenarios also always is helpful as well. However, this may not be the case in a hospital facility because the operations, uh, because the uh, activities that are performed and the steps that the patient needs to go through are at different locations, at different levels of the hospital, sometimes active, even at, at different locations. And definitely the, looking at the process map initially is going to give you a uh, a much better idea as what you are going to see or what you expect to see. So if as a systems engineer, you end up working for a healthcare facility, uh, I would say the first thing to ask for is if they have a process map of some of the care that they provide. And then if they do not have a process map, definitely you want to develop uh, uh, one or more process map for them, depending on the type of service that they provide. So as I said, uh, a process map graphically shows this, the step-by-step -step actions that are performed till the patient receives the care that they need. And um, what are some of the advantages uh, or benefits associated with process mapping? In process mapping, it can graphically represent all the steps uh, it's uh, usually, if especially if the processes are very complex, and as I said, if they are performed at different parts of the facility, we can definitely uh, show all of that at the process map. Um, and um, if there are some specific inputs or some specific data that needs to be available for some of the operations to be done, we can also specify those on the process map as well. And um, also on process map, uh, we can find out what are some of the potential bottlenecks that exist? What are some of the redundancies that exist? Um, redundancy actually in healthcare setting happens a lot. Um, that's something that, as I said, um, I myself experienced firsthand 
uh, when I needed to go to the emergency room uh, a couple of weeks ago, the first uh, nurse that called me to the room uh, checked my blood pressure, my heart rate and uh, temperature. And then I had to go and wait for, the, for them to call me for the treatment. But then when they called me for the treatment, another nurse performed the exact same thing. Again, they checked my blood pressure, temperature, and so forth. And, and my situation, and, and I understand that may be necessary for a patient that is in critical situation. So blood pressure, temperature, and things can go uh, higher or lower. But for my situation, that was not the case for sure, because my situation was not a super urgent situation. So, um, but at that point in my mind, I, I was, I was questioning like why they are performing everything again. So maybe when we develop the, uh, not maybe for sure, when we develop the uh, process map of the patient flow and all the operations that are happening, we can see the redundancies, redundancies that ha are happening and we can question those. Some of them need to be there uh, because of, of the nature of the work, but some of them can definitely be removed. And once those redundancies are removed, the time that the patients need to stay are removed, the, the costs can be lower and so forth. And all of those can be achieved by developing a process map for the patient flow. One other thing that we can do uh, as we develop the process map is we can identify which one of the operations are value added, which one of them are not value added. Uh, value added are the ones that are done to um, meet, to provide care for the customer or to enhance the service that we provide for the customer. Uh, but the non-value added are the ones that does not do much for the customer, like the duplicate efforts, like the extra, the second time of measuring blood pressure and weight and height and all of that. Definitely that's the non-value added operation that is performed. All the weights that happen, that if, if, if you are developing a process flow of, uh, of a person um, being in an emergency room, all of those wait times and all of those idle times are considered as the non-value added uh, time that the patient has uh, spent or, uh, in the emergency department. But all of those are possible by, by the process map. So when we want to develop a process map, uh, first of all, define the scope for your work. Um, and this is important. Otherwise, you don't know where, when to stop and where to stop. Um, identify the units that are involved in the, uh, in, the, in the process map that you are going to develop and, uh, and, and how far from, from which point to which one exactly, from the um, admission of the patient to the discharge of the patient, from admission of the patient to the point that the patient is referred to a specialist, for example. Identify exactly what is the start point, what is the eight point, end point for your process map. And then the, make sure to document all the steps and all the sequences and all the intermediate steps. So make sure not only you know all the steps, but the correct sequence that uh, exists between those steps. And also make sure to identify all the inputs and outputs for each one of the processes. That's also is going to be helpful to make sure that do we provide the right input to the operations or to the task that needs to be performed and transition from one, one, action, one step to another, are they done correctly or not? And um, once the process map is done, we can look at it and we can ask some questions. Are there any redundant operations that have been performed? And um, which one of those redundant operations are necessary and which one of them are unnecessary and should be removed? Um, are, is this step that we have taken to perform the operation is correct or there is something out of the steps? Are we missing any step or is there something that we can add to improve the whole process? Um, and uh, how many how much time we have lost in the whole process, and what are some of the what are some of the actions or operations that are value added, and what are some that are not value added? Um, these are some of the symbols or notations that are used to develop a process map. 
However, it's not a Bible. Uh, I have seen different process maps that have used different symbols. The only thing that matters is that if you develop a process map, maybe you want to have a little dictionary at the bottom, something similar to this to just say, what is each icon that you have used? A little one. It doesn't need to be super comprehensive. Just put a little dictionary at the bottom uh, for each one of the icons that you have used. Just write down next to them. What does that mean? Does that represent an operation? Does that represent a decision? Does that represent an input, an output, and so forth? So th that in that scenario, anyone who is going to look at your process map can understand what is going on. This is, for example, a process map for a patient um, that is going from emergency room to the inpatient care, to the hospital. So uh, initially the patient arrives. Um, from the um, emergency, uh, patient arrives to the emergency department. And then there is this many registration, they get the information of the patient. Then they do a little triage to see what is the what is going on with the patient and what the patient needs. Um, do does the patient needs a bed or not? If the patient does not need a bed, then they go through the rest of the treatment and the patient gets discharged. However, if the patient needs a bed in the emergency department, is the bed available or not? If the bed is not available, then the patient has to be discharged or be transformed to another healthcare facility. However, if the bed is available, then we send the patient to the uh, emergency department bed. And then um, the nurse is going to perform the initial exam. Um, and then the, 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 the physician is going to perform the initial exam. And um, the emergency the department physician may order some tests. For example, for my situation, I had to do some uh, x-rays. So the emergency, the physician, after performing the initial exam, they perform some lab tests or some um, x-rays and so forth. And uh, then the, depending on the operations, the, the, the test that needs to be performed, the, the test, the nurse may need to per, collect the blood, help to perform the x-ray and so forth. And uh, then they send the patient to uh, perform the test, get the x-ray or do anything that they need. Um, and then the emergency department checks the result. And um, if uh, identifies if um, any additional test is needed or not, or, if, or any additional, um, um, or, or if the patient needs to consult with other uh, doctors or other physicians or not. And if the patient needs to do the consulting, then, um, they are going to send a patient for their consulting with other physicians. Uh, and then, uh, so these are the set of other uh, um, doctors that they are available in the emergency department. And then the consulting team perform the operation, perform the consulting, and, and they I identify if they need to admit the patient or the patient can be released. If they need to um, admit the patient, uh then they need to they need to put the order for the admission of the patient to the hospital if they do not then um they still talk about if the patient need additional consulting or not um if they need if the patient needs to get admitted to the hospital then that's when the search for the bed starts and all the boarding happens if there is no bed and then the patient is finally transported to the floor when the bed is available. If the bed is not available, then as I said, the whole boarding is performed. And then uh, if the consulting with other doctors can do the job, patient gets the treatment, then the patient uh, leaves the facility and gets discharged. And um, Also, 
for the patients that are coming from outside hospital. Um, and they finally get transferred to the uh, transported to the hospital. They get the they get the service that they need, and they finally leave. So that's the scenario when the patient may arrive from emergency department, go to the emergency department, and finally needs to go to the hospital, or the patients that are coming from other hospitals and that needs to get admitted as well. Um, and that's when finally the patient is. So this obviously can show you what are what is the complexity associated with the uh, admission treatment and uh, either um, acceptance of the patient to the hospital or not what are some of the redundancies that have happened what are some of the decision points and um, we can even go further and for some of these operations we can identify the data that has go to perform the operation and the outcome from those operation or the data that needs to go to the next operation, we can identify which one of them are important and the ones that add value and which one of the which one of them are more in the have the nature of waiting. Actually in the next presentation that we get to um, some of it, uh, we are going to talk about value stream map. And value stream map is actually similar to the process map. The main difference with the value stream map and the process map is that in the value stream map, we also identify the time of each one of these operations. And we also, by looking at the time um, uh, and the type of the operations that are performed, we can also identify which one of them are the ones that add value and do something for improving the care of the patients and which one of them do not add value, like all the waiting times that basically do not do any good for the patients. However, the, for, for us as systems engineers in a hospital setting, the very first thing that we wanna do is to look at the process map. As I said, always ask for process map of different services that they provide if they have it. That is, that is going to be the best quick understanding uh, of what is happening in the hospital. Uh, and as I said, a lot of these operations are happening at different locations or at different levels and so forth. And so it's not really easy for you to just walk in the hospital and see what's going on and what is the right order. Um, if they do not have the process map, definitely one of the first steps that I would recommend is to develop one because later, if you wanna also propose any recommendation in terms of some of the operations that are redundant, if you wanna propose something related to changing some of the orders, if you wanna argue something related to the wrong order for some of these operations, then it's always easy to do the discussion based on this map. So that's the map that you wanna take with yourself, walk with them over this map and then, um, once they agree that, yes, this is the map that represents what's going on, then you can go ahead and talk about the, the, the concerns that you have or the, the, the points that you think that can, can be improved or can be questioned, and then go to the next step about what can be changed and how things can be improved or what can be removed or what can be added and so forth. So developing a process map as I said, is the first step that you want to take when you enter a healthcare setup and you want to help them to improve the performance of the facility as the system engineer. So to summarize, patient flow is the process by which the patients move to the facility through the hospital and improving the patient flow is going to improve the quality of care that we're going to provide to the patient and also improve the, the timeliness of the care and it's going to reduce the time that the patients are going to end up uh, spending at the healthcare facility at the end of the day. Okay. Um, and for the process map, as I said, there are some notations, but you can use different locations as long as you can put a little dictionary next to your process map and identify exactly what is what. So. If you use these icons, put a little dictionary next to your map and identify what this icon means, what, what this icon means, what this icon means, what each one of these icons means, and then you're good to go. So anyone who is going to read your process map first is going to read those and then understand what's going on. Um, if, is there any question, guys? 
Uh, I had a question. Um, I, I'm pretty new to this. I wanted to ask, are those icons like industry standard or um, do they get redefined often? I haven't seen much that are industry and standard. Most of the times, for example, I have seen that a uh, uh, rectangle represents uh, operation. Most of the times I have seen that this icon is used for decision point. Arrows are the ones that shows the flow and so forth. Um, sometimes I have seen maybe inputs and outputs to change, but I have not seen, um, I, I would say actually with um, quite certainty that they are not industry specific for sure. Um, okay. these, are, these, are, these are the icons that you can use in any industry, but just make sure, as I said, um, you, you know exactly what icon represents what.